Fantastic. Who's ready for Pastor Justin Stockman? It's going to be absolutely stunning. So he's here uh, on the in the morning service and in the after and in the evening service. We have a special evening service that night as well and advance. So that's going to be fantastic. So you ready? Now we have to honour uh, Pastor John Warren, who's here today, and uh, we uh, as a church, uh, John, just watch in awe of what both you, Catherine, and Poppy uh, are doing over in England. And uh, it was good to see Australia win the Ashes back, which is certainly very good. But uh, we know that uh, you guys are called to the northern northern area of uh, England and that you are winning that for Jesus. So we just thank you so much. Come on, let's give him a hand. Amen. Uh, bless you. Bless you. So, oh. oh, look, some of you are standing. That's You're very kind. You're very kind. So... Uh, it's fantastic to be with you. I'm so happy uh, to be here. So uh, many of you will remember in 2013, uh, this church sent myself and my family out from here all the way uh, to the north of England. And uh, we live in a town called Halifax, a town about the size of Ballarat or Bendigo uh, that's in uh, West Yorkshire uh, in the north of England. And uh, did you send a? Do you think, Pastor Matt, that that we were sent such a great distance because we were Collingwood fans, or is that ju- <laughs> that just that, that just a coincidence? Was it? I th- I'd always thought it was a coincidence, but after the the comment about needing uh, to be a Richmond fan to be a member, I'm, I'm re- revisiting that. So, anyways, um, uh, so uh, we've uh, been. Uh, yeah, in the UK since 2013, six and a bit years, and so God called us to uh, start a church and to, uh, to do missions work into uh, Eastern Europe, in particular to a nation called Moldova, part of the former Soviet Union, and so we've, uh, we've just finished our, in July, we finished our sixth uh, missions trip to Moldova, and uh, so building some great connections there, and uh, God will continue to expand our, our influence in that nation. Uh, so that's uh, really exciting. And uh, once we'd started our church in Halifax, we, uh, I was just really overcome with how spread out the population is uh, in, um, in England. Like, uh, I mean, here in Victoria, you've got, what, um, what, five out of seven million people or something like that live in Melbourne. So, um, you know, if you've reached Melbourne, then... Uh, you know, that's most of Victoria taken care of. But in, in England, there's so many towns. There's so many towns. That's unbelievable. Towns and cities everywhere. And the people are very spread out. Uh, and it was just overcome with the need for more churches, not just in our town, but in, in all the other towns. And, uh, and so Lord's, uh, the Lord has directed us and led us to plant a daughter church um, about uh, 20 k's down the road a place called Todmorden, a town of 20,000. And then we went in another direction to a town called Brighouse and uh, started both those congregations in 2017. And we're planning to, uh, we're in the process of planning a fourth congregation in um, a town you might have heard of called Huddersfield, which is a bigger place, a um, uh, Geelong sized uh, town there. So, um, and so I wanted to, uh, uh, say thank you to some of the, the folks uh, who have helped us on the journey. So there's uh, some unfamiliar faces here this morning. So uh, some friends of ours, are Paul and Vicky here, give us a wave, guys. Uh, Paul and Vicky are, are friends of ours from years, years ago, and uh, they felt uh, that, uh, that for a long time they'd planned to um, spend a season living in the UK, and so uh, God led them to uh, be a part of uh, our church, and so they have led this congregation that we've planted in this town, their third one in Brighouse, um, so they've led that for the last uh, 18 months or so, and, um, and done a fantastic job, uh, really great pastors, and really, if I'm ever, if, like, if someone comes for prayer after the service, and, and Paul and Vicky are, are praying with them or talking with them and everything. I stand there and I just think to myself, John, you just shut up because anything that you will say is not going to be anywhere near as good as what they are saying right now. So just 
button it. Um, so they're really uh, gifted pastors, and uh, uh, they're, they're with their, um, uh, their daughter, Catherine, who's uh, doing Bible college at Planet Shakers Bible College, part of the youth leadership at Planet Shakers Church. And, we, and this, this church that we planted in uh, Todman and is uh, really called to reach youth, and so Catherine's you know, training uh, in uh, youth leadership. So that's interesting, isn't it? So anyways... Um, <laughs> So, uh, and then uh, Rod and Sally are uh, here. Give us a wave, guys. So, um, Sally's a, a friend of Catherine's, and it was, I think it was the day of the 2004 federal election that, um, because Sally was running a polling booth and Catherine and I uh, worked on it for a few extra dollars, and, and Catherine said to Sally, uh, is that right, 2004? I think it's right. Um, um, and Catherine said to Sally, I know you're not walking with God right now, but if you want to get back on track, give me a call. And so a few months later, Sally placed the call, and, uh, uh, and so uh, Catherine and Sally have had a close relationship uh, ever since then. So I've been staying with Rod and Sally. Uh, Rod's the best optometrist in all of Melbourne, so um, they've been lovely hosts uh, to me uh, for the last few days. So that's, uh, that's who's uh, with me today. So um, thank you guys for coming along. It's really awesome. So... Uh, uh, we're talking about mission uh, and everything, and uh, what we discovered uh, in our adventures in Britain is that uh, we're, the name Northern Lights Church is the, sort of the name that uh, we picked. Our, um, Catherine would say God gave us, but I was just like, yeah, okay, that's, that's, a funky na- that's a funky name, we'll go with it. I didn't have strong feelings one way or the other, but, but since we got going, we realised that God put our mission into our name, and we're really called to light up the north of England, and um, uh, someone else is going to have to be raised up by God to reach Scotland. Uh, the south of England, again, is someone else's problem. But the north of England, that is where I am called uh, to reach, and so that's what we're doing uh, in Jesus' name. So I want to talk to you a bit about what, what your mission is. I want to open the Bible, and uh, I'm going to focus on a, a sentence that Jesus said uh, where he so beautifully summarizes what uh, your mission in life is. Because a lot of Christians really agonize over you know, guidance and calling and like, you know, God, what do you want me to do with my life and everything like that. A lot of Christians struggle and grapple with these things. But I'm going to give you something that's really simple this morning. It's not simplistic, but it is simple and profound, uh, and it's going to help you understand what God has put you on this earth to do. Um, So one of the things that Jesus did during his ministry was he trained up uh, people. He obviously had his 12 disciples uh, who he was very close to, and then he had a a wider group, and he sent uh, 72 of his followers out Uh, in pairs, and in Matthew chapter 10 is where Jesus gives his instructions to this uh, large group of people that he's about to send out. So I want to uh, pick it up uh, in verse 5. Jesus sent out the 12 12 apostles uh, with these instructions. Sorry, just the 12, not 72. Um, Down in verse 7, go and announce to them that the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Or other translations put it, freely you have received, freely give. Um, then, he, then he goes on. Uh, don't take any money in your money belts. No gold, silver, or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person to stay in his home until you leave town. So Jesus is really telling them, I want you to travel light, like really light, like walking stick. That's too heavy, right? I want light. We're going really light. And and you might think, well, why? Why do you care so much about the walking stick and all that? You know, um, uh, Jesus was actually, with, with this set of instructions, Jesus was very pragmatic uh, with 
the, his followers. And what he was saying to them was, if you are self-funded and self-reliant, then you will, you will be tempted to set up shop in a place, the first place you come to, that just so happens to be not particularly fruitful. But he was commanding them to go to places where their ministry was actually received, where it was fruitful, right? Because he wants fruit. Um, I've appoint- he says elsewhere, I've appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, right? So he wanted their ministry to be fruitful. And if he made their, their very food and shelter, if he made that dependent on a welcoming crowd, then he knew that that would be really fruitful. Um, and so he simply, but, the, but it's in verse 8 really where he summarizes what he's getting them to do. He says, freely you've received, freely give. This is your mission in life. Give away what God's given you. It's that simple. I swear, if I were writing notes right down, I would write that down, right? My mission in life Give away what God has given me. That's all you have to do. That's all Jesus is asking you to do. Give away what he's given you. And you're thinking, well, that's, uh, that's all well and good. But um, like when it comes to curing people of leprosy, my, my, my tally is in the low single digits. <laughs> like, like very low, very low. Understand, right? You might not be the kind of person, um, you know, Pastor Justin, uh, used by God to heal someone at the local shops, right? It's, yeah. That's simply giving of what God's given him. That's right. That's right. Simply in the place where he lives, yeah. right? It wasn't complicated or difficult. He just was bothered to take the time to stop and pray for someone who is in need. God He simply chose to freely give of what God has given him. Uh, And if you're thinking, well, God hasn't given me much, I reckon if you actually stopped and think about it, you might realize, well, actually he has. Actually has given me, well, there's this and there's this. And I'm not necessarily talking about the ability to raise the dead and everything like that. Like if you are a good cook, if you are a good host... That's a gift of God on your life. And God wants you to use that. So if God's given you enough food to fill a pantry and the ability to put some of it in the oven and have good things come out, if he's given you that, give it away. That's what he wants you to do. Give away what he's already given you. So if you've got the ability to cook, give it away. Cook good food and bless people with it, right? It's not rocket science. Simply give what God's given you. That's that's worship. Do you realize? If you simply cook a meal and be a blessing to someone, that is worship that delights the heart of God. It really does. If you you are Melbourne's best optometrist, right? If God has given you the ability to work a, in a particular role and do a good job, do it with diligence and do it skillfully, that's a gift of God. Yep. Yep. That's a gift of God. So serve in whatever, if God's given you a particular occupation, given you a particular career path, then that in you acting with integrity and diligence in that job, that's worship. That is worship that pleases God. And so, and with whatever money you earn from that, if you you give uh, generously with what God's given you, this is precisely what God wants you to be doing. You don't need to prostrate yourself in your bedroom every night and beg God for the angel Gabriel to appear and tell you what you're going to be doing with the rest of your life. Just keep worshipping. Just give away what God's already given you. 
right? You don't necessarily need to pour out your heart to God and beg him for more. Just give away what you've already got. That's simply what God is asking you to do. Give of what you already have. And as you go along, you realize, oh, actually, this this thing that I can do, that's God, right? That's a gift of God in my life, right? And so this is what we've done Uh, in the UK. I realized that God has given me a, a gift of faith, right? If I've got... 10% 10% of everything that I need to plant a church, then I'll just start it and pray for the other 90% to come in. And God's answered those prayers on a number of occasions for us. You know, this is, and I've realized this is, this is what God has given me. And so therefore, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep planting more churches until I stop breathing, right? I'm just going to, that's, that's my plan, I'm simply giving of what God has given me. The gift that God's put on my life, I'm simply using. I'm simply doing it, right? But I didn't, I just started doing it and realized that I could and just kept doing it, right? There was no angel. There was nothing like that. Just whatever you've been given, give it away. And that's how. God will continue to expand and unfold his will for your life, right? You don't need guidance. You don't need a word that resolves every question that you've got. All you need to do is to be active in giving away what God's given you. That's simply how it works. So that was my first point. Use the things that God provides. Whatever he's given you, Just get on with using those gifts. My second point is is this. Do it with the people that you meet along the way. You know, my conviction, having having travelled more over the last recent years and seeing uh, the cultures in in the rest of Europe, as well as further afield and, and everything like that, I think that the distinctive thing about... Western culture, as in England, Australia, USA, um, those cultures, I think that what stands out about us is that we think in a very individualistic way. And most other people, and certainly New Guineans and Fijians, um, most other people think we, whereas in the West, we often think I. And so my first point was framed entirely in terms of I, give away what God has given me and everything like that. But actually, it would be, it's let us give away what God has given us, right? So do it with the people that God has put you with. You see, Jesus sent out his followers in groups of two, And he told them to connect with other people on the way. And you have no idea who God is going to bring across your path. But I really believe that what God has for you is deeply connected to what God has for his people gathered in this place. So if God has put you as a part of this church and as as a part of this movement, then that's going to impact what you do, where, where, it's going to impact where you will be fruitful. So um, we are part of, uh, we as in my church and Manningham and um, other connected churches are a part of this denomination, CRC Churches International. Our denomination is deeply committed to evangelism, to church planting, to missions uh, to the ends of the earth and to Christian education. Uh, these are, there's more to it than just that, but, uh, but having been a part of it for a while now, I can see that those things are, are the highest priorities. There's many other priorities. It's a thick Bible, isn't it? There's many things that, uh, you know, that we're called to do and all of that, but, but the highest priorities of the movement that God's put this church 
in and therefore has put you in, the highest priorities are those things I listed. Evangelism, church planning, missions, Christian education. So here in this church, you have the dream of starting a Christian primary school. Fantastic. Now, some of you are thinking, that's great. Fantastic. I am really looking forward to that coming to pass. Um, you know, I'll play whatever role is needed in making that happen. Great stuff. Others of you are thinking, whatever. Cool. If they want to go and do that, and knock themselves out. But personally, I don't care. That's what some, some of you are thinking. You just, just couldn't care less, right? Now, that's okay, right? Because not everyone is excited about Christian education. Some are and some aren't. But you have to realise, if God's put you in a church that cares about Christian education, then he wants you to start caring about Christian education. <laughs> Your fruitfulness is connected with the people that God brings across your path. And if God has called you into this congregation, then God has brought you into the path of a movement called the CRC and of a particular local church right here in Templestow that has a dream of starting a primary school. And what you will discover is that if you throw yourself into helping with starting a new primary school, even though it would, it would never have occurred to you to do that, but if you throw yourself into it, God will open doors for you in a way that will blow your mind. That's how it works, right? Because we're not individuals each fulfilling our own destiny. God's building a church, a body who are all connected. So if this is who you're connected with, then your fruitfulness is tied up in the fruitfulness of your local church. Right? So I would urge you to under have the maturity to understand that even if it's a project that's not close to your heart, that God's in it and God will bless you if you throw yourself into it. And I worked this out at an embarrassingly late age. I really did. I really did. We just so deeply have that individualistic mindset so deeply ingrained in us. But for me, the penny finally dropped only a short number of years ago. But now I'm quite enthusiastic about it all, right? Because <laughs> now I actually understand this is, this is a key, right? This is a really a critical thing to understanding how you are going to be fruitful, how you're going to achieve the things that God wants you to achieve, right? It's connected with the people that God has brought across your path. And so that's why Jesus tells them, whenever you enter a city or a village, search for a worthy person. And so if you're a part of this church, the worthy people that God's connecting you with are the other people within your church. And so do it, give away what God has given you, but do it with the people that God's connected you with. And then there's a third uh, thing that Jesus gives us. He, he goes on and says this. Look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that encouraging? I used to work in Kurong, the Christian bookshop, many years ago, and I... Uh, Verse 16 there, that first sentence, I never saw that on a plaque. <laughs> never saw that on a plaque. But that's what Jesus says. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And all these apostles went, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> all right then. This is what he says. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves, but beware, for you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. When you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say, 
for God will smite those who try to arrest you and will come and solve all your problems and will make sure that you are relaxed and comfortable and no one will ever annoy you or bother you ever again. Oh, hang on. Ah, oh, no, no, that's not what it says, is it? No, no, I see, I see, ah, I see what I've done here is I've, I've read from the, uh, the wishful thinking translation. <laughs> ah. Yes, yes, the wishful thinking translation. It has, it's very unreliable, very unreliable, right? No, it's not what Jesus says. He says it's going to be tough. He says it's going to be real tough. He goes on. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it's not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is what you have to understand. Simply giving away what God has given you, which sounds like the most kind and loving thing. I mean, who doesn't love a gift, right? It sounds easy. You would think that you would be well received if you were trying to give someone something. But isn't that the funny thing, right? That Jesus came and did nothing but love people and taught them truth and encouraged them and built them up and gave them what they needed to be free. That's what Jesus did. And for doing that, They put him on a cross and killed him for loving them. They killed him. So you better believe that your giving of what God has given you is going to be really tough. Because often our gifts are not perceived to be the ones that people want. That's how it was for Jesus and that's how it's going to be for his followers. That's how it's going to be for you. Sometimes it's going to be really tough. But this is what he says in verse 20, is that he is with us in those tough times. right? So don't expect that God's going to solve all your problems. But do expect that he'll be with you in the problems. In the midst of the challenges and struggles, he will be with you always. So I can promise you problems. I promise. Right? Put it on a plaque if you want, right? (laughs) Jesus said in this world you have trouble, right? But we don't need to be... But we can keep going through the problems because he's with us. He's with us. So we don't give up. We keep going. We're tough because our Savior was. And some of you are thinking, well, that's you know, it's all well and good for you know people who are traveling the world to they can give what God's given them, but you know, in my my more modest situation, I don't don't have much to give. And I'm gonna I'm gonna finish by encouraging you with with a story. There was a guy who was born in Sydney in uh, 1885 named Arthur Stace. And uh, he was born in some really uh, rubbish circumstances. Not yet, right? Not yet. Um, <laughs> and so he, um, he was uh, uh, in and out of state care as a child, didn't really get an education, was, uh, was borderline illiterate and... Uh, uh, as a sort of mature age recruit, ended up spending a few years uh, fighting in World War I. Uh, but apart from that time as a soldier, uh, most of his working life, when he wasn't uh, imprisoned or, or anything, was uh, most of his working life consisted of helping out extended family members who were parts of criminal gangs, working as a lookout uh, for you know, illegal brothels and gambling houses. And, uh, and that was... Uh, the life that he knew, uh, doing it tough uh, in Sydney uh, in the you know, early part of the 20th century. And, uh, but finally, 
at age 45, he was in church somehow or other and gave his life to Christ and became a Christian at age 45. Uh, Two and a bit years later, he was in church and the preacher preached from a verse in Isaiah, uh, says this, uh, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. So God's described in that verse from Isaiah as being the one who inhabits eternity. And the preacher grabbed that word and cried out, you know, eternity, eternity. I wish that I could grab everyone on the streets of Sydney and say, where will you spend eternity? And as Stace sat in the congregation and hear him preach that message, it's now 1932 when this happens, he began to cry and he got overcome with this strong sense that God wanted him to put that word in front of the people of his city. And so he got some chalk and wrote out the word eternity. And as he did it for the first time, it came out in this really attractive, uh, beautiful kind of script that he'd never learnt and really surprised him when he did it. And so from that point onwards, starting in 1932, continuing until his death, 35 years later, 1967, a couple of mornings a week, he would get up at 5 a.m., take his chalk and write that one simple word, eternity, all over the pavements of Sydney. And he just put that word. God didn't give him much, right? He had a rubbish childhood and a rubbish adulthood. But God gave him the desire to put one word in front of his city. And so faithfully, every week for 35 years, he grabbed his chalk and he wrote eternity, 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 that one word from Isaiah. He put that word in front of, I said, not yet, not yet. (laughs) He put that word in front of the city of Sydney. And then he died Uh, in 1967. And, you know, of all the things that happen on our planet, like, what, what what are the events that attract the biggest number of eyeballs ever? Well, I guess it's the, um, the Soccer World Cup final would, would be up there, you know, towards the, the top of the list. Probably the uh, Richmond. <laughs> That's really funny, Richmond. <laughs> so, um, no, 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 I think you're referring to the 2010 grand final, but anyway. Um, um, but the Olympics, the Olympics are surely right up there. It's in the most watched uh, events that, that happen on our planet. And so when, the, when Sydney hosted the 2000 Olympic Games, as a part of the opening ceremony, for, for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, Arthur Stace had reached such a level of fame or, or notoriety, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, he was simply so well known for so faithfully putting that word eternity in front of Sydney's eyeballs that when they hosted the 2000 Olympics, they put his word on the Harbour Bridge as a part of the opening ceremony. And now, you can put it out, right? See, that was put there by a man who understood, freely you have received, freely give. He simply gave of what God gave him. And he didn't have much, but he gave away what he did and as a result, who knows how many people were moved by that's that's a that's a quote a one word quote from Isaiah right there. Yes. Right? Who knows how God used that? So don't tell me that God hasn't given you much. Because I bet you've got more than what Arthur Stace had. Yeah. 
and yet he faithfully gave away what God gave him every week for 35 years. So simply give what God has given you and keep on giving. And you will end up doing precisely what God wants you to do. This is your mission in life. Give away what God has given you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you're so generous, Lord, and you've gifted us in so many ways and and given us so many things. So, Lord, we just want to commit ourselves this morning to serving you. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to giving away of what you've given us. Lord, the many, the so many gifts, abilities, the skills, all the resources, Lord, that you've poured out into us as a group. Lord, we just want to acknowledge that you're the source of those things. And we just want to acknowledge that we're the stewards of those things. And we want to say to you, Lord, we're going to be faithful with what you've given us. We're going to give it away, Lord. We're going to give away all that you've brought into our laps. We'll give it away for your glory. We'll give it away to please you. We'll give it away, Lord, because we love you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Folks, I've, just, uh, I've loved sharing with you this morning. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, Matt, I'm going to hand back to you now, but I'm, I'm so looking forward to uh, having sharing lunch with you and everything. So, uh, so bless you. And I, just, uh, I plan to be here this time next year. So uh, we'll do it again then. Bless you. Come on, let's give John a hand. So incredible. So Now I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that word. And uh, yes, the word is about giving, but the word is also about eternity. As 